Robert Blecker began his article, Penalties, Punishments, Prices, or Rewards, by citing the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' observation, quote, even a dog distinguishes between being stumbled over and being kicked, end quote. The relevance of this is that we seem to think that being kicked warrants criminal punishment, whereas a true accident, not the result of carelessness, warrants no violent response. The larger context of Holmes's quote is as follows, quote, vengeance imports a feeling of blame and an opinion, however distorted by passion, that a wrong has been done. It can hardly go very far beyond the case of a harm intentionally inflicted. Even a dog distinguishes between being stumbled over and being kicked. The early English appeals for personal violence seem to have been confined to intentional wrongs. End quote. I suspect that you're familiar with this sentiment. Somebody has made a promise to you and you discover the promise has been broken. Your response is anger and a sense of, let's see how they like it if somebody does the same to them. But if it was truly an accident, a true misunderstanding, the result of somebody lying to them or a greater emergency, then all is forgiven. The anger and the want of revenge evaporates. What is this all about? Now, Holmes further made the claim that the institution of criminal punishment seems to spring from this sentiment. There seems to be a strong correlation between the types of acts that generate this emotional response, anger and the desire to pay back, and the types of acts made criminal, at least for the more serious crimes. Lecker follows this Holmes quote with evidence that it has empirical support. He wrote, quote, Animal behaviors have recently confirmed what pet parents long observed. Dogs also have an innate sense of justice and become angry or despondent when treated unfairly or cheated out of a promised reward. Perhaps further research will reveal that they accept their keeper's penalties with contrition only when they think they're deserved. Quote. In 1962, the philosopher Peter Strassen noted these two types of what he called reactive attitudes in the highly influential paper Freedom and Resentment. We have one type of reaction to harms and benefits that are a result of the forces of nature like a disease or a hurricane. We also have a similar type of reactive attitude when nature or luck produces benefits, like giving us a beautiful day on the day for a family outing, or the lucky roll of a dice in a game. These are similar in the sense that we assign no blame for the harm or credit for the benefit. Strawson calls these reactive attitudes the objective attitudes. This is the attitude we adopt when a harm or benefit comes from nature as a mere object or thing. We have a different type of reactive attitude when a harm or benefit is delivered to us from an intentional agent. Somebody deliberately does us harm, takes or damages something that's ours, insults us, assaults us. We tend to react to these with anger and some sense of blame. On the other side, an uncle who contributes generously to one's education or the friend who's there and abandons their own plans when they need comfort and support. We tend to react to these with a sense of gratitude. Dawson called these reactive attitudes the participant attitudes, of which anger and gratitude are the paradigm examples. And yes, we might get angry at a computer for dumping our paper, or a car that's not starting, or a carpet for tripping us as we head to the kitchen for a snack, but we recognize that this is not real anger. This is frustration. We'd hardly tell our friends at lunch, I'm still mad at my carpet for tripping me last night. The concept of an intentional agent is important in this distinction. An intentional agent is a creature that acts for reasons. Why did the chicken cross the road? To answer this question, one identifies a goal that the chicken has, for example, to escape from the butcher, and a means for obtaining that goal to get on the other side of traffic. Mere forces of nature don't have goals. They have an effect, but they're not intentionally trying to bring about that effect. The effect is an unintended consequence. So the difference between our two types of reactive attitudes is that the objective attitude is a reaction to the mere forces of nature, forces that lack intention, and the participant attitudes respond to intentional behavior, behavior carried out because the entity performing it wants certain things and is trying to realize what it wants. 
there are still some types of human behavior that produce objective attitudes. The actions of somebody who's mentally ill, such as a parent with Alzheimer's, who treats one as an unwelcome intruder, or the young child who mishandles and destroys some prized possession. We can shrug these off without anger or blame. They don't know any better. The objective attitude also applies to true accidents, those that are not the result of negligence. This refers back to the Oliver Wendell Holmes quote, we can recognize being accidentally bumped and being deliberately pushed. We react to a true accident with an objective attitude, to the intentional assault with a participant attitude. So why do we have these two types of reactive attitudes, and why do they work this way and not some other? As Blecker notes, we see these two types of reactive attitudes in non-human animals. An animal will react one way to the forces of nature, the wind, the rain, biting cold, and quite another way when an intentional agent, like another animal, enters its territory, gets between it and its offspring, or tries to take its food. This suggests the possibility of an evolutionary explanation. Having the two different types of reactive attitudes and using them in the appropriate situations can aid in an organism's evolutionary fitness. If a harm or benefit comes from a force of nature, there's nothing we can do about it. We can certainly experience grief at an unfortunate loss, such as the death of a loved one. We can experience relief or appreciation for some good fortune. These reactions can be explained merely by the fact that we find a value, whether bad or good, in the situation that came about. But anger and gratitude have no place. However, even though anger and gratitude can't alter the course of a hurricane, it can alter the behavior of intentional agents. Expressions of anger at a creature that enters one's territory, threatens to take one's food, or threatens one offspring can give an intentional agent a reason to consider some other course of behavior and produce an evolutionary benefit for those who react with anger in circumstances where anger is useful. It's a waste of energy to get angry at a hurricane. Expressions of gratitude, similarly, can get other creatures to repeat beneficial behaviors, grooming, sex, the sharing of food, and mutual defense from predators which tend to produce evolutionary benefits as well. By the way, it should be obvious that I'm not talking about a conscious plan here. Once intentional agents came into existence, nature began to evolve in ways that took advantage of this fact. The bee sting almost never kills its victim, but it does give the victim a reason to leave the hive alone. The bullet ant has one of the most powerful stings among land animals. It's called a bullet ant precisely because if you're forced to choose between being stung by a bullet ant or wounded by an actual bullet, it's pretty much a toss-up. Six of one, half dozen of the other, as the saying goes. This provides a powerful reason not to mess with bullet ants. Even plants and fungi who don't have much of a reputation for carefully considered schemes on how to influence other creatures have evolved to take advantage of the evolutionary benefits of creating reasons. One of the most effective ways of creating reasons not to perform a certain type of action is to associate it with nausea. Many types of mushrooms cause nausea. An animal eats that type of mushroom once, gets sick, and will avoid eating anything that even looks like that type of mushroom into the indefinite future. If you have a food aversion, like I can't stand beans, lima beans, kidney beans, string beans, any type of bean. My brother won't touch anything if he sees a mushroom in it. If you have a food aversion, this may be because you got sick to your stomach shortly after eating that type of food. The nausea might have had nothing to do with the food, but your brain will make the association and make sure you stay away from that type of food in the future. I find peppers to be an interesting instance of this. If a pepper is eaten by a bird, the seed goes right through the bird and comes out the other end as a perfectly viable seed ready to grow into a new plant. If a pepper seed is eaten by a mammal, that destroys the seed. So peppers produce a chemical, capsicum, that triggers the pain receptors in the mouth of a mammal, but not birds. This gives mammals a reason not to eat the peppers, but doesn't give a similar reason to birds who eat the peppers and spread the seeds far and wide. Our reactive attitudes, like the chemicals in some mushrooms that produce nausea or in peppers that produce pain, function to give others reason not to perform certain types of actions. 
then we evolved to react with anger to behavior that tends to be harmful. When it comes to creating reasons to perform or not perform some action, we really have two options available. One way to create reasons not to perform some type of action is to create external reasons. These are straightforward. Try it, asshole, and I'll make sure you regret it. One avoids the behavior because one wants to avoid the consequences. The advantage of this type of reason is that it can be produced and altered quickly. You can create or remove an external reason in an instant. Another advantage is that it can be highly complex, as anybody who ever tried to learn tax law or contract law can tell you. A second way to create reasons to perform or not perform some action is to create internal reasons. Here's a straightforward example. A culture that condemns people who break promises can create in its community an aversion to breaking promises. They come to keep promises not because they seek to avoid punishment, but because breaking a promise feels wrong. They have a conscience, betraying a friend, harming or taking another person's property without their consent, rape, assault. Cultural forces can make these types of acts less appealing in themselves. Most of us, if we found a wallet with money in it, would return the wallet with the money. This has been tested. Some researchers performed a study in which they left a wallet on a bench or on a sidewalk. Some wallets had money, some had a key, and some simply had an ID. They conducted this experiment 17,000 times all over the world. They would then watch to see what happened. Most of the people who found a wallet returned it. Interestingly, the more money they put in the wallet, the more likely people were to return it. The best explanation for why people return the wallet has to be internal reasons. The research subjects, random people on the street, had no reason to expect any external penalties. This was before people could attach GPS trackers to their wallet, and even then, one can keep the money and drop the wallet. Either way, it is internal reasons, not external reasons, that provide the best explanation for why people returned the wallet. And in case you're interested, Switzerland is the best place to lose a wallet. Over 80% of the wallets that had money in them were returned. China is the worst place to lose a wallet, with a 20% return rate for wallets that had money in them, and 10% if it had no money. In the United States, you have about a 60% chance of getting your wallet back with your money. One of the disadvantages of relying on internal reasons to alter behavior is that they're difficult to create. It takes work, and things can easily go wrong, particularly if one is being raised in a subculture, like an abusive home or a violent neighborhood, where harmful behaviors are reinforced and helpful behaviors are punished. And these norms can only have a limited complexity. Remember, we're talking about the cultural development of certain desires and aversions. Now, think about a common desire, such as a love of chocolate. You can come to like or dislike certain types of chocolate, but you can't come to like chocolate except on Thursdays from 11 o'clock to 11.47 in the morning. But note, you can create an external reason, a rule, that punishes people who eat chocolate between 11 o'clock and 11.47. This is one of the key differences between external and internal reasons. The advantage of developing internal reasons is that they work even when one won't get caught. External reasons can't get people to return a lost wallet when they have every reason to believe that nobody will find out if they pocket the money and toss the wallet. Internal reasons can get people to return a lost wallet. But the development of internal reasons requires a culture that nurtures this attitude. External reasons can prevent people from breaking into your bank account and taking your savings if they think they can get caught. But they can't stop somebody from doing so if they have found a way to do it without getting caught. But a conscience can stop even this person. When it comes to preventing drunk driving, date rape, cheating on an exam, or child abuse, internal reasons are far more effective than reliance on external reasons alone. This distinction between internal and external reasons has been noted since Aristotle. Lecker quotes Aristotle, quote, Self-respect and shame before one's own conscience should keep one from doing a wrong, even if no other man will know of it. He who is kept from wrong by law is likely to sin in secret. But he who is brought to duty by conviction is unlikely to err either in secret or openly, end quote. 
So we influence behavior by creating reasons to perform useful actions and not to perform harmful actions. How do we create reasons? What is the method by which we can create reasons that reasons using people will then use to make useful behavior more common and harmful behavior less common? Well, we create external reasons quite simply by linking behavior to consequences that a person either wants in the case of producing an incentive or wants to avoid in the case of producing a deterrence. This is quite simple and straightforward. If you want people to come into your restaurant and eat, you offer them a dining experience that they value. If you want to stop them from walking across their lawn, you put up a sign that says, Caution, Minefield. Internal reasons can, in part, be created using these same systems. Positive and negative consequences, rewards and punishments in the biological sense, trigger the reward and punishment systems of the brain. In loosely technical terms, these rewards and punishments trigger the dopamine pathways of the brain to rewire the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the part just above the eyes, to promote behavior that's rewarded and inhibit behavior that produces punishment. In addition, among the tools that cultures use to create internal reasons, cultures use praise and condemnation. Praise a certain type of behavior, and it helps to encode the brains of people in that community to perform that type of action more often. Condemn it, and brains get encoded to avoid that type of behavior. It isn't a perfect system. It often fails. But partial success is better than no success. Now let's look at Blecker's distinction between punishments and price. I discussed this in some detail in other videos, but I'll give a brief account here. A penalty counts as a price when it's simply an additional cost that's imposed on those who break a rule. A late fee, for example, is a penalty. It's not a punishment. If you're in a situation where you're going to be late, then you perform the task late, compensate others for the cost of the delay by paying the late fee, and that's the end of the matter. A defining characteristic of punishment, particularly criminal punishment, is a message of condemnation and contempt. It's not just, you owe us this, but you deserve this, you contemptuous piece of Rigelian slime. Prices, we may say, are concerned with external reasons only, with establishing a cost for a certain type of behavior in order to make it less common, but says nothing bad about the person performing that behavior. Punishments, on the other hand, seem to be concerned with both external and internal reasons. It doesn't stop at adding an external cost to performing some type of action. It includes an expression of condemnation and contempt, the type of response that triggers in the community as a whole internal reasons not to perform actions of that type. It's meant to link the behavior to guilt and shame, if not in the person being punished, then in the community as a whole. And it says to the whole culture, don't be the type of person who would do such a thing. Vandalism, rape, assault, child abuse, murder, fraud, drunk driving will create external reasons not to do these things, but we want you and everybody in the community to have internal reasons not to do these things as well. Important point. The fact that we evolved a disposition to react to certain types of behavior in particular ways doesn't justify reacting in that way. It explains the system, but it doesn't justify the system. For example, we seem to have evolved a disposition to divide the world into tribes of us and them, and to devote ourselves to promoting the us tribe at the expense of all of the other them tribes. The fact that we have evolved this disposition doesn't justify the wars of conquest, genocide, slavery, or any of the religious, racial, ethnic, or state violence that this system seems to motivate. Even if the account provided here is true, the question of how to justify criminal punishment remains, though we may perhaps have a better idea of what it is we're trying to justify. On the other hand, we know that pain is a natural response to certain types of situations that tends to threaten our evolutionary fitness. We can come up with an explanation as to why the pain system exists and how it functions. And yet, because it will hurt, not only explains why one avoids doing something that could cause extreme pain, it provides at least a pro tanto justification. In the absence of any other reasons weighing against it, avoiding pain is a perfectly legitimate reason not to perform some action. In this video, I looked at what might be called the retributivist sentiment. This is a disposition to react to the intentional behavior on the part of other people 
in ways that will give others reasons to repeat beneficial behavior and avoid engaging in harmful behavior. This is a disposition that we find in other animals and even plants and fungi. We seem to have built the features of this sentiment into the practice of criminal punishment. Punishment is not only a harm inflicted that creates an external reason not to engage in certain types of behavior, but contains an element of condemnation, creating internal reasons not to engage in that type of behavior. This can account for Blecker's distinction between prices, which contain no condemnation and don't worry about the agent's internal reasons, and punishment, which includes an element of condemnation and consequently aims to produce internal reasons not to perform acts of that type, not only in the person punished, but in the community as a whole. However, the fact that we can explain a distinction falls short of justifying that distinction. More would need to be said to show that we are, in fact, justified in writing these sentiments into the criminal law, particularly since what we're writing into the criminal law is the claim that we are justified in inflicting intentional harm on other people as punishment.